Hello and welcome back to another episode. Now today I'm really eager to talk about Zelda The Ocarina of Time and what it was like in the run-up to the release of this game uh, and then actually the run-up to me finally getting my hands on a copy because um, the two events were separated somewhat in time. So where else could we begin? Uh, we're starting here at the beginning of the game. I've skipped through all the uh, the exposition and the navvy stuff just because well that voice gets pretty boring pretty quickly, uh, pretty annoying. But um, this room, first of all, this room uh, I love this room. This is the first room that you really see in the game. It's uh, it's uh, Link's house, and I just remember being struck by how how detailed it is. Um, uh, yeah, compared to to previous Zelda games, uh, for example, on the Game Boy, on the on the uh, Super Nintendo, or even on the NES. Uh, this, this, the, the level of detail in this room, the sort of the, the wood grain on the floor, the uh, the different uh, things he's got in buckets there, like a shovel or an axe or something, uh, pitchforks, a couple of pitchforks actually. This is actually quite a scary room actually when you think about it. <laughs> but um, uh, this room, I I loved it, and I just wished, um, I always wished it was a little bit more interactive. But um, anyway, before we head out the door, I just want to talk about very briefly about um, the build up to the game. I remember this game's release in November 1998 and a friend of mine had uh, two older brothers, actually we'll head out, two older brothers and those older brothers did have an N64. My friend um, sort of could share it with them but really it was their, their console and they would tease me and well him but especially me relentlessly because they knew just how much i wanted to to experience first of all the n64 but then also uh the ocarina of time now the uh we didn't actually get an n64 until that christmas until the christmas of 98 i think and uh, that christmas actually what we got was super mario and goldeneye we didn't get uh, Zelda Ocarina of Time. It would be it would be around a year uh, or thereabouts, more or less I think my birthday, uh, before I got hold of this game. And I was asking them in November, so before I even knew I was going to get an N64, asking them what's the game like, what's, what's Ocarina of Time like? And they're like, oh yeah, oh it's amazing, they'd look at each other, isn't it? Yeah, oh it's great, it's really really great. Uh, and they talk about being able to, to, for example, you know, lock on to things and uh, do back jumps and this kind of thing. Um, and the uh, the sword play and just how perfect it was, uh, and just the feeling of the game. And basically, they were teasing me. They were teasing me no end, and they were loving being able to tease me. I do love, incidentally, that you got this uh, this bit of um, graffiti on the on the uh, on Link's treehouse. <laughs> uh, presumably, he's drawn this. Um, a monster, a little person fighting a monster, pretty cool. Anyway, um, yeah, they were teasing me no end. They couldn't stop teasing me. And I was being tortured by this. For example, uh, other people who I knew who had the game would talk about how um, they really liked uh, the way that, for example, in the village where, where we are now, um, you would get these sort of particle effects on the screen. You see how it looks like pollen or bugs are sort of flying past, which gives a real sense of, of depth of space while you're running around. They, they, all these little details were being analysed because it was it was groundbreaking stuff. But, I mean, yeah, sure, Mario 64 was was incredible, but this game was building on that on that 3D world and taking Nintendo's flagship characters into the third dimension. And I was just going nuts. I couldn't, I could you know, so, so I would, I'd go home and I'd play my Game Boy, I'd play Link's Awakening, uh, I'd, I'd maybe go around to a friend's house and have a go on their snares and play uh, A Link to the Past. But it just, it was getting less and less effective at, at negating my need to play this game. <laughs> um, and uh, as I say, it'd be, it'd be, it, it felt like forever, but eventually I did get hold of a copy. And um, I'll always remember uh, this this opening section of the game where you're trying to get to go and see the Deku tree and this little um, little man here, little shite of a man, uh, won't let you go past the great Mido um, and <laughs> so you have to go and find a sword. Now people who played the original Zelda on the NES there's there's a there's an iconic moment and I've, I've now played that. I, I hadn't 
when I played this, but I have now, uh, where you have to get you get your sword. Uh, the character says to you, "It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Take the sword." And what's what's happening now is sort of the equivalent of that. You have to make your way through this maze, um, and let's just read this sign here. Hold hole of Z. Let's go through this small hole. Stand in front of it. Press A, a action. Okay, cool. So there we go. In this maze, this is the equivalent of that moment when you get the sword in the NES, um, in the original Zelda. Uh, this is, I suppose, the opening up of Link's world, the beginning of, of Link's adventure in this game, starting to really open up and, and get going. Now, oh, need to avoid the... Because around this corner we have a chest, and in the chest is a sword. Now opening this chest, I wasn't ready for this when I first opened it, but this animation, the music, the lighting effect blew my mind when I first saw it. It's incredible. Now again, it's really hard to encapsulate just how exciting this was. <laughs> to people at the time, uh, especially to me at the time. I was so amazed. I was what, 14 years old, 15 years old, and uh, seeing that animation, seeing the music, hearing the music in a what sounded like a really rich format, you know, not quite orchestral obviously, but getting there. And then seeing the sword floating above his hands, uh, spinning, all this stuff was just brand new and it really was uh, an interpretation of Zelda, uh, the Zelda game, sorry, uh, the Zelda franchise as, uh, as it was becoming in 3D. They'd, they'd done just as well as they had with Mario, but in this instance with Link and the world of Zelda. Now, um, again, when I first got this game, I was playing it like like no one's business. I couldn't I couldn't stop playing it. And what impressed me, um, as with, for example, with GoldenEye, as I've talked about in the past, were things like, say, the menu system. This is a huge menu system when you press start. And uh, I just need to uh, equip the sword there we go. Um, but I was intrigued by, for example, look at all, look at all the space there for, for the items. That's incredible. Uh, the map, the fact that it opens up bit by bit, the clouds are obscuring the world, but bit by bit you'll, you'll, you'll reveal more and more. Um, the quest status, look at how many quests there are. There are songs to learn, uh, there are medallions to get, there are uh, gems to find, jewels to, to, to collect. This was a huge game and uh, to be honest, I don't think I knew how big this game would be until I got out of the village and uh, went to um, uh, went to Hyrule Field for the first time. And I think most people who played this game uh, back then were they had that sense of awe when they first realised just how, just how big this game was going to be. Um, especially that first time when you when you go into Hyrule Field after you've spoken to the owl, the owl comes down and starts. Uh, giving you all sorts of bits of wisdom, you're like, get out of the way, Owl, I need to see, I need to see the world. Um, <laughs> oh, ah, uh, see, I always psych myself out there. What you're meant to do is, if you jump across, you get a prize. There we go, finally. <laughs> I knew you got some um, rupees if you jumped on the stones properly. Anyway, I happen to know I need to collect 40 rupees in order to buy a shield. I need a sword and a shield. The Mido, the great Mido, won't let me pass otherwise, or Mido. Um, but again, just exploring this world was just so exciting. And this is something else that really excited me, actually. If we go up here, up this path, and this is, this is gonna sound really odd, but it really did. I was really, really impressed by can I climb? Oh no, I can't climb like it. That'd be it. By the 3D rendering of the hearts in the game. That's it. Again, it might sound a bit odd, but I'll go, go onto the bridge. Yeah, so there, the 3D rendering of the hearts floating around on top of the, uh, the house there. I found that fascinating. Again, I'd always sort of wondered what did these things look like to uh, to Link as you were running around in, in, the, in the world of the computer game. And now we're getting like an insight into that in 3D on the N64. So 20 rupees now. I need to get another 20. But uh, basically, this is what the first section is all about. You're essentially, you're farming for rupees. You're learning how to navigate the world and uh, learning simple things like 
how to pick up stones. Press A, buy a stone to pick it up. Mean old Mido, he made me pick up the rocks in front of his house. Honestly, oh, Mido, Mido, scumbag. Oh, there's a rupee, nice. Now, there were lots of other parts of this game that just blew me away. Uh, the first time you visited Zelda in the uh, in the uh, palace, seeing, for example, the Easter egg of um, Mario uh, through one of the windows there, um, you have had the uh, things like being, being able to s uh, slash at uh, an object with your sword or bushes with your sword. It's slashing at the chicken, um, just as in the Game Boy game, had a similar effect. If you, ha if you don't know what effect I'm talking about, then uh, I won't spoil it for you. But it's, uh, it's rather pleasing after a while. Uh, the chickens get their revenge. Now, <laughs> but uh, the, I suppose the scope of the game is what surprised me and impressed me. I wasn't, I just wasn't ready for it. I wasn't uh, at all expecting it to be as amazing as it was. And I think that's why, to this day, the Ocarina of Time tops people's you know, best game ever lists. It's the, it's the package, it's the delivery of this game, which just blew everyone away. It was just so astonishing uh, to play this game for the first time. And it's one of those things where I'm so grateful that I was actually around to experience it in that way. So many people simply don't get that. They they have to play these things as retro now. You know, this is a, this is a cool retro game, you know. Um, but actually experiencing it as the height of technology at the time, the best and most perfect expression of the Zelda world, uh, is an excitement which I'm so grateful for. I'm so grateful that I was able to able to I suppose to partake in this time in gaming. I know this sounds really makes sound really really stupid, but. It's true, it was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But also in particular, I remember, I really do remember the fun that people had teasing me. They knew how much I wanted to play this game. <laughs> and um, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't um, fun at the time, but I look back with sort of fond memories on how clearly my passion was there and, uh, and they could see that the, all they had to do was just keep on just poking me until, until I finally got a chance to play it. So I've got need four more rupees. Actually, what I might do is go into people's houses. Pretty sure you can smash pots. No? Let's check there. There we go. One rupee. And here. A heart. Another I see, another 3D rendering of the recovery heart. Very cool. And this treasure chest. There we go, 42 rupees, finally. So now I'm gonna head out and uh, go to the shop and buy my sword, my shield. Yes. Now in many ways, this this, this particular incarnation of, of Link um, set the way that games would be played in the Zelda Zelda franchise, really, from then on. So things like, for example, being able to lock on to, to, to characters, in this game, using a fairy to sort of represent that that um, capacity um, became standard. But at the time, as I say, it was groundbreaking, uh, and it took some getting used to. I'm not going to lie. I mean, at first, it didn't really feel like a Zelda game, as strange as that may sound. It felt like a much bigger adventure game. For me, a Zelda game had almost been like chess, you know, top-down puzzles to figure out, this kind of thing. But now, suddenly, this was a world that we're exploring. Um, but uh, no, no, there's no way I'm, I'm complaining about that. Although, I suppose I would complain a little bit about the way that the Ocarina of Time Link became the standard look of Link. I suppose at least until Wind Waker came around. He, he became a bit more, especially the adult Link, became sort of the standard. Um, I think that's a bit of a shame. There's something lost in the innocence of the character there. But uh, but at the very least, uh, it suits this game, and I can see why they made those design decisions. Um, hang on. If you want to pass through here, oh, equip a sword and shield. Sorry, I've bought one. I haven't equipped one. But yeah, I really appreciate the, uh, the old school link. I really like, for example, the artwork in... Um, I remember looking at the artwork in uh, the uh, the uh, manual for Link's Awakening on the Game Boy, and really liking the sort of fairy, uh, the boy, the fairy boy kind of look to him. And I suppose he is a bit of a fairy boy here at the beginning, 
That sounds so dodgy, but you know what I mean. Um, but certainly the adult Link and then Link into, for example, Twilight Princess has become the one that everyone seems to want to have, this more realistic uh, teenage dark Link. And um, I don't know, I've still got a soft spot for the, for the, the more innocent Link. Um, and even though, you know, even though this is where, where that darker Link began, um, I definitely don't hold it against the game. I just love this game. And, oh, let's see. A bit of combat. There we go. Yes. Oh, we've got a Deku stick. But again, the fact that you have the object rendered above the character floating was amazing. It blew my mind as a 15 year old, 14 year old, 15 year old. Come on, there we go. And here we go, I'll just go all the way through. And here we are, finally, at the Deku Tree. Now, I, sub I think what I'll do is I'll leave it there for, t for today. Um, I really just wanted just to talk a little bit about the impression that this game made on me. And the fact that actually no game really since has made such a, a particular impression on me. The, uh, you could say that Mario um, 64 was similar in many respects, uh, in so much as it, it was this, like I said, this, this 3D realization of a 2D character's world. But this game, because it was such a complicated world, and you had the side quests, uh, you had little Easter eggs thrown in there, and you had, um, for example, the language of the, the Deku tree, thou hast returned, it says on the screen. Um, it was just a rich experience, and I'm so grateful that I got to experience this the first time round. I really am. <laughs> oh yeah, before I forget actually, uh, I'm such a big fan of this game that a couple of years ago, um, a local company, local to where I live, gave me uh, this uh, as a sample to um, uh, to sort of see if, if I thought it was worthy of The Legend of Zelda. It's a, it's a real working ocarina, it's uh, clay baked, um, they gave me a series of, um, of instructions on how to play different songs from the game, I'm not going to try it here though. Um, but uh, yeah, so I became, I've, have become known as a bit of a Zelda freak and the Ocarina of Time, uh, people, you know, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty much aware of how much I love this game. But this, if you, if you want to know how and where to get it, I'll put some details in the video description below. It's a wonderful object, the, uh, the Ocarina of Time. Anyway, as ever, until next time guys, do take care. Bye bye.